Welcome to Touching the Ozarks, the weekly television broadcast ministry of Ozark Full Gospel Church, featuring the Bible teaching of Pastor James Akins. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned as we get ready to hear another message from God's exciting word. Jesus said, when I die for the world, I'm going to the tomb and I'm going to get up from the grave and I'm going to offer salvation to the whole world. And I want you to know for the Christian, the best is yet to come. At Ozark Full Gospel Church, we have three exciting services every week. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 p.m., and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There is meaningful praise and worship and powerful Bible preaching at every service, and we never close for any reason. In addition, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events and most current information. We look forward to seeing you soon right here where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. Tonight, and we've been preaching on famous verses from the Bible. We've been doing Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Last Wednesday, we were in the New Testament. This Wednesday, we're in the Old Testament. And we are in one of the books of Moses. In fact, it's the last book that Moses gave us in Deuteronomy. And um, if you don't mind, stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be in the 31st chapter. And we're going to be looking at some beautiful things tonight, some things that will strengthen us. It's easy to find. It's between Numbers and, Deut- and Joshua. It lists Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're in chapter 31. And we're going to read down to verse 8. And verse 8 is our famous verse from the Bible. In fact, verse 3 says, God will go before us. And verse 8 says, God will go before us. And this Bible says all through it, God will go before us. And there has been songs sung by the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of songs singing about God going before us to help us along. Verse 1. And Moses went and spake these words unto Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said to me, or unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. And the Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. And he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of, the, uh, of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to unto all the commandments which I commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said, You're it, buddy. No. He said unto him, in the sight of all of Israel, be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. I want to use for a subject out of the phrase of verse 3, and of course, our famous verse in verse 8, the Lord, our God, goes before us. You may be seated. Our God goes before us. 
Moses is getting ready to go to meet with God, and he's going to leave planet Earth and go into the presence of Jehovah, the great I Am, the one he stood before at the burning bush. It's interesting in verse 2, it was on Moses' birthday, 120 years old on his birthday, he gave word to the nation of Israel that Joshua would take the children of Israel <coughs> into the promised land. He also said on his birthday that he would not be able to go up and take the children of Israel <coughs> into the promised land. But it wasn't because Moses was feeble. It wasn't because Moses was not strong. Because we're told in the <coughs> 34th chapter that Moses was very strong. His eyesight was perfect. His natural forces had not abated. Moses was so strong because he had been preserved by the presence of the Lord that Moses, I don't think, could have died unless God smothered him to death with Holy Ghost kisses. <coughs> and that's what God did when he took Moses up onto uh, Mount Nebo, there at the highest place of Mount Pisgah. He went up to the plain of Moab. Moses went to see God, and God said, okay, it's time for you to come home. And Mo I don't know how Moses died other than he sh God smothered him to death with Holy Ghost kisses. I don't think it was a horrible death at all. I think God just pulled back the veil, and Moses was consumed and swallowed up into the incredible, mighty, majestic presence of God. God buried him in the plain of Moab. No one knows where Moses' tomb is to this day. The writer of Jude says that the Lucifer, the devil, contended and disputed over the body of Moses. And of course, the archangel said, that's not going to happen. He said, the Lord rebuked thee. Moses was very strong. He was not feeble. The reason Moses could not take the children of Israel into the promised land was not because he was 120 and all worn out. It was because he had smit, smitten the rock at Horeb twice. He was instructed first to speak to the rock, which is a picture of Christ. And when he, when he, well, first he smote the rock, excuse me, he smote the rock first, which is a picture of Christ. Christ was crucified. And then when they needed water again, God told Moses, speak to the rock. Just talk to the rock. And water will come out. And Moses was angry and the people had frustrated him to the point that he smote the rock twice, and God said, I, 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 um, Jesus is crucified once. He's the rock. He was crucified, smitten for our sins, and never to be smitten again. If you want forgiveness after you come to the cross of Calvary, then you go back to him and you speak to him. You're not going to have to be saved again. You're not going to have Jesus crucified again. It's just going to the Lord and speaking to God and asking him for forgiveness. A great truth. Moses could not go into the promised land because he violated what God told him to do. He disgraced the rock, which is Christ. But there's a greater reason than that. And the greater reason that Moses could not go into the promised land with the children of Israel was because Moses is the lawgiver. Moses is a picture of the law. And the law cannot take us into the promised land. The law cannot save us. The law can bring us to Christ. The law can bring us to a place of decision. The law is not weak. Moses was not weak in body. He was perfectly healthy. The law was not weak in, in itself, but we were weak in our frail bodies to obey and keep the law. Thank God Jesus Christ came and took care of the law and fulfilled the law through his 
perfect life. Now that doesn't give us an excuse to sin, but it gives us a great excuse and a great rejoicing blessing to say, I want to live the best I can, the closest I can, and as much as I can in the presence of Jesus Christ because he has done so much for me. Now, I'm going to go a little different direction tonight. There has been probably thousands of songs that have been written about God going before us. If you stop and think about it, Jesus, everyone in this room, Jesus went before us in death, and he rose again from the grave. If you stop and think about it, everyone sitting in this room, Jesus went before us in suffering, in persecution, and he paved the way for us and said, don't get discouraged when people persecute you, but rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. And so Jesus goes before us. You know how I'm going to get to heaven? Because Jesus went before me and he knows the way. Amen? I love it. Jesus knows the way. He's been there before. He came to earth. He went back. He, I, I would say he knows what he's doing. When he said, I'll come and take you back with me into the presence of the Lord. And so on Moses' birthday, he says to them, I'm not going into the promised land. I'm going to let Joshua take it. But I want you to understand that the Lord will go before you, just like he's went before me all through this journey. The Lord will go before you, and he will take care of you. We serve a God that is the God who goes before us. This verse 8 is incredible and it's beautiful because the Lord has showed us that He's not expecting us to be something that we're not. God is not expecting us to be some kind of superhuman person, the superhuman person awesome power of God lives in us. And that doesn't make us superhuman. It makes us supernatural of new birth in Christ. Many of you in this room don't think of yourself as being supernatural, but what more, what could you not be? I mean, honestly, how could you not be anything but supernatural? You, you listen to a supernatural Bible, a supernatural Holy Ghost lives in you, you received a supernatural birth by being born again. And one day Jesus Christ is going to catch you up into the clouds to meet him in glory supernaturally. God is going to take you into the presence of God supernaturally. It's going to take a supernatural God to get us off this planet. And thank God I know him and you know him. His name is Jesus Christ. I want to draw your attention to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 and 2. And we're going to spend a little time looking at this because it shows us how God watches over us and protects us. Chapter 43 of Isaiah says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. I love that. Thou art mine. Well, if something's mine, I'm going to take care of it because it's mine. And if it belongs to God, he's going to take care of it because it's his. Amen? And not only is it his because, it, because he bought it and paid for it by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has redeemed us, he bought us at great price. He paid entirely too much for what, for what we're worth. But the reason Jesus paid so much more than what we're worth is because God is so much more worthy to be praised. And the worth of God exceeds any worth that you and I have. Thank God I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He said, fear not, because I've redeemed you. I have called you by name. Thou art mine. Look at verse 2, and think of verse 8 of Deuteronomy 31. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. 
When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. There's three words, uh, there, there's a phrase made three times in this verse two that I think is incredible. It says, it's the word through. God takes us through the waters. He takes us through the rivers. And he takes us through the fire. Now, he didn't say he would take us around the fire. He said, I'll take you through. He didn't say he'd take us around. He didn't say if you face troubled waters. He said when you pass through those troubled waters. He didn't say if you face raging rivers. He said when you face raging rivers. He doesn't say if you face overflowing rivers or you face fire. He says when you go through the fire. Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I want to point out three things about this phrase in verse 2. When thou passest through the waters. Now, he said, I'll be with you. He said, what's the difference between waters and rivers? Well, they're both made out of the same stuff, but what's the difference? Well, when he says, when thou passest through the waters, he's talking about floods. When you pass through the floods, not only is he talking about when you pass through the floods, there's something about a flood. Flood leaves stagnant waters behind. Flood leaves debris behind. Flood leaves, uh, 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 floods leave uh, 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 swamp lands behind. Flood leaves, uh, leaves uh, uh, cesspools of, uh, uh, of b- uh, uh, disease breeding waters behind. And Jesus Christ, uh, God is saying to us, when you walk through those infested waters, when you walk, you know, uh, uh, let me just put it uh, simply like this. Flood waters, they overwhelm us. Rivers raging, they sweep those precious things away, washes things away. Fires destroy and burn us and cause us great scars and pain. Floodwaters, they overwhelm. And floodwaters do overwhelm. And the Bible says that we will pass through those waters. And he's talking about floodwaters. When floodwaters come, You live, you survive them. I mean, in this room, sitting here saying, I've I've survived some flood waters. When you survive them, it doesn't stop. Oh, yeah, you survived the flood because when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against him. And yeah, you, su- you survive the flood, but even after the flood waters and you, and you, you face things, there's still waters that you've got to walk through. We're talking about disease-infested waters. We're talking about mud-sunken uh, uh, waters. We're talking about overwhelming diseases and depression and discouragement. We're talking about a life of debris that, that has been produced because you have been overwhelmed by attacks of the enemy. But I want to say to you right now, when you pass through the waters, when you walk through the marshy lands of, of the flood waters, when you walk through the waters, God said, I will be with with you. I'll watch over you. You'll pass through. You're going to get through these troubled times. You'll get through these these, uh, marshy waters. You'll get through these hard times in life. God's going to take you through. Hallelujah. And one reason God's going to take you through the waters is because the God we serve that goes before us, he's a water walking God. God's a water-walking God. Who walked on water first? Was it God or Peter? Who walked on the water first? Was it Jesus or was it Peter? We know it was Jesus. Peter just tried to, you know, copy. And I want to say quickly that Jesus Christ first is the one who walked on waters. And he walked on waters to excite us. Jesus walked on the water to excite his disciples. How many know they were thoroughly excited when they saw Jesus walking on the water? And first they were terrified. Ah, oh, there's a spirit walking toward us. And, and Jesus Christ said, be of good cheer, it is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter says, whoo, if it's you, Lord, let me come. Now, what was Jesus going to say to Peter? No, don't come. It's me, but don't come. <laughs> I 
You know, Peter put Jesus on a spot. And, and you do too. You do too. Sometimes we do things that's totally unnecessary, but God goes ahead and, and, he, and he plans ahead and he helps us and gets us through the problem. And Jesus comes walking on the water to give those disciples in that boat a refreshing excitement. He came walking on the water because they were weary, they were tired, they were drained, they were blisters on their hand, they were, they were just worn out and they didn't know what to do or where to go and they were, uh, the wind was contrary, everything was coming at them and Jesus said, I'll excite them. And Jesus comes down off the mountain, walks on the water. I mean, no, that is exciting when you look up and see Jesus walking on the water. And first it terrified them. And he said, no, 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 be of good cheer. It is I. And Peter says, "Woo! I want in on the action. Uh, if it's you, let me come and walk to you on the water. And Peter got on the water and walked toward Jesus. Amen. And a lot of people want to criticize Peter because when he saw the wind boisterous and the waves, he began to sink. And they want to criticize Peter. But I want you to know something. God was already way ahead of Peter. Jesus was already went before Peter. Je Jesus was out there in the water with Peter. And when Peter started to sink, Jesus was already there. Amen. He was already there. And Peter wouldn't have had the, Peter would not even have had the idea of getting out of the boat unless Jesus was there exciting him. And so Peter comes, and by the way, Peter not only walked on the water once, he walked on the water twice. He walked on the water once to Jesus and he walked on the water a second time back to the boat. Amen? And some of us, we walk out on the water of life and sometimes we need to walk back to the boat. Amen? But I, I, you know, the thing is, we, we get into, a, into an area where the waters are, you know, depressing, we're discouraged, we're, we've kind of lost sight of our direction, we're a little bit depressed, there's things coming at us, and Jesus says, okay, I want you to see a water-walking God. Jesus is saying, I want you to see a God that raises Lazarus from the dead. I want you to see a God that opens blinded eyes. Jesus said, I, Jesus said to the world, I want you to see a God that can speak to the, the, to the lame and the lame for a leap for joy. I want you to see a God that can walk on water, multiply the, the bread and the, and the fish. I want you to see a God that can open the blinded eyes and cleanse the leper. I want you to see a God that says, I love you. And I care for you. And I go before you. And I'll be with you. And I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the kind of God Jesus Christ brought to us. The true and living God. Amen. Amen. Woo. Matthew chapter 14 is where Peter walked on the water. The second thing I want to point out is we have an upstream God. You say, what do you mean by an upstream God? I didn't say extreme God. I said an upstream God, like stream of water, upstream God. Not an extreme God, but an upstream God. We have an upstream God. Notice it says, when you pass to the rivers, and rivers raging sweep things away. Rivers take us away, takes the things we have away. Rivers that are flood rivers destroy things when you're swept under the currents of the rivers. And that takes me back to Joshua chapter 3 where Jordan was full bank. It was harvest time. Jordan was raging with water. Jordan was full stream, wa water high and rushing down toward the, toward the uh, plains and then into the Dead Sea. Jordan was ro roaring with water. And then God says, I want you to go across Jordan. I want you to, uh, J uh, Joshua, I want you to take the children of Israel and tell them to go across Jordan. And Joshua probably thought, well, God, you could have picked it when Jordan was just a trickle. But no, you wait till it's flooding. See, they could have went across Jordan easy when it wasn't harvest time, but when it was harvest time, the waters were flooded. There was plenty of rain, and the flood waters were coming. 
And so God says to Joshua, I want you to go across, get your priest and the Ark of the Covenant, and I want you to get ready. And when they walk into the Jordan, when their feet touches the water, the brim of their shoes, their, their feet touches the water, the waters will roll back, the waters will be gone, and they'll stand in the middle of Jordan, and the children of Israel will walk across, maybe a million of them walk across on dry ground uh, over into the other uh, part of Canaan land, into the, in that uh, wonderful promised land, and just right next to it was the city of Jericho. So you can measure from Jericho back to where the waters came down. The Bible says that God went upstream. God went upstream. You can read this in chapter 3 of Joshua. God went upstream. And he went up to the city of Zaratan, called at that time the city of Adam. And the city of Adam was right next to Zaratan, the city of Zaratan. Now, the city of Adam now is near Jerusalem, but in that day it was more in the Jordan Plains. So it's a different Adam, the city of Adam. But what you need to understand is this. God stopped the waters at Zaratan, where the city of Adam is. That's where he walled up the waters. 20 miles away from where the children of Israel were, from here to Springfield, Missouri, God stopped the waters in Zaratan at the city of Adam, and he walled up the waters, and he made the waters rush down Jordan River, full bank, into the Dead Sea. He timed it exactly. We have an on time ahead of us God, a God that goes ahead ahead of us. They didn't know, but God, God was telling Joshua, go forward, cross Jordan, and they got the Ark of the Covenant, and they began to walk, and he told the priest to walk, holding that Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and when they stepped into that river, immediately the water was gone. Why? Because God planned it 20 miles upstream. We have an upstream God. Hello. God plans things far ahead, 20 miles away. God's already got it ready. And so it's all set in time. The second, the second the priest touched the feet, their souls touched the feet of the water, the second they stepped on Jordan's water, the water was gone. The second God had it timed down to the very second. He stopped the waters. He walled them up 20 miles upstream. And by the time they got ready to cross Jordan, they stepped just at the right time in the Jordan, water gone. That's an on-time God. That's a God that's upstream. Hello. God was preparing the children of Israel to go, and he was the God who goes before us. Isn't that good? That raging river that would have swept them all away, God said, no, it's not going to happen because I have a plan, and my plan is in action right now. I want you to know that God, Ozark Full Gospel Church has an upstream God. I don't know what we're going to be doing five years from now, but God knows. I don't know what we're going to be doing this time next year, but God knows. And he's an upstream God. He's preparing our crossing at any moment. He's preparing our victory at any moment. He's preparing our battles to go forward and, and possess the land of promise. He's preparing, and that upstream God gets it all ready. I, I believe there's an upstream God for my son Joshua. God's doing stuff in, right now that is going to affect him years from now. God is preparing things for Joshua right now upstream. And God's preparing things for you in this auditorium upstream. You say, what am I going to do? God knows what you're going to do, and God's preparing upstream for you. Ten years from now, that's not going to catch God by surprise. God's got a plan, and when it happens ten years from now, God says, I got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. He walled back the waters at Zaratan, and there the waters were held back so the children of Israel at that very moment and second would step into the water and it's gone and they march across into the 
Canaan land, into the promised land. So we have an upstream God. I don't know what I'm facing 10 years from now, but God's an upstream God. Amen? When thou passest through the waters, the flood waters, I will be with thee. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Why? Because God is working on your behalf ahead of time. You, when you get to tomorrow, God is already there. Five years from now, God is already there. When you get up in the morning, God is already there. 10,000 years from now, God is already there. A million years from now, God is already there. He's the God who goes before us. He's the God that secures us and watches over us. I don't know what I'm going to go through from day to day, but I know the God who holds the world in his hand holds tomorrow in my hand. I, I know that everything that's happening in my life, in the future, God has his hand involved in it because I'm not to fear because I've been redeemed. And God says, because you are mine. So God's planning for everybody in this room. An upstream God. You don't know what's going on upstream, but God knows what's going to happen downstream. And when it comes time for you to cross that river, don't, whip, don't be afraid. Because you're going to cross that river into the promised land. Don't be afraid when it comes time to cross that river. Because you're going to cross that river and God's going to make it easy. God goes before us. Amen? Now, I'm preaching better than you're responding. Now, as I said earlier, flood waters overwhelm us. Stagnate, disease us, depress us, discourage us. Raging rivers sweep things away, discourage us, and bring debris into our life. Fires destroy and burn us and chart us. But I want you to know we've got an on-time God, and we've got a God that goes before us. Hello. I said, hello. God has a plan. He's an upstream God. God has a plan. He's a water-walking God. God has a plan. He knows you're going to sink and you'll shout, Lord, save me. He'll be right there. If Jesus was somewhere else, Peter would have died. He'd have drowned. But God is right there. And when you go through a problem, God is right there. And when, when your God's a water-walking God, and not only is my God a water-walking God, but our God is a God that sees, goes before us. He's upstream God preparing for what we're going to face in the years ahead. The days ahead. Amen. Yeah. Not only is he the God who takes care of us, but the Bible says when you pass through the fires. He said, neither will the flame kindle upon thee. I love that phrase, neither will the flame kindle upon you. God is saying you're not kindling. You're not kindling. You're not fuel for the fire. You're not kindling. When you pass through the fire, you'll not be burned because you've got on the asbestos suit of Jesus Christ. You've got on the power of Jesus Christ. I read in Daniel chapter 3, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bow before Nebuchadnezzar's image. They refused to bow. Nebuchadnezzar says, if you don't bow, I'm going to put you in a fiery furnace. And they said, we refuse to bow. We're not going to bow to your golden image. We're not going to bow to your false god. We're not going to dance to your music. We're not going to, uh, we've made up our mind. We're going to serve uh, our, the God of heaven. We're going to serve God. And we're going to honor God. And we're going to praise God. And they refused to bow before the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had put up in the plain of Dura. And they refused to do it. And Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow, I'm going to put you in the fiery furnace. I'm going to crank it up seven times harder and I'm going to throw you in the furnace of fire. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego said, bring it on. If we burn up, it's to the glory of God. If we don't burn up, well, glory to God. Either way, it doesn't matter because we got a God that goes before us. Amen. And the Bible says that when Nebuchadnezzar had Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego thrown into the fire, they were bound. And they fell down into fire. 
And the fire was so hot that the soldiers that put Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the furnace fire, they were burnt to a, they just disintegrated. The furnace was so hot. And there was a discussion going on in heaven. And God said, we got to do something quick. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego is about to go into the furnace. We got to do something quick. And God says to Michael, how long will it take you to get there? And Michael says, well, I'm a warrior. It'll probably take me a couple of days, but I can get down there. God says, that's not good enough. We got to be there quicker. And he says to Gable, how long will it take you to get down there? And Gable says, I can get there in about 20 seconds. God says, that's not good enough. We got to get there quicker than that. He said, I'll just go myself. Michael and Gabriel says, how long is it going to take you? And he said, I'm already there. I'm already there. And they fell bound into the furnace of fire and the fire released them from their cords that held their hands, released their feet and their hair wasn't even sins, not a hair on their head sins. And there they're walking around in the midst of the fire. You say, why were they walking around? Because the devil's fire ain't hot enough to keep a child of God warm. They had to walk around. They're dancing, they're praising, they're loving God. Why? Because there's someone there with them. Hello. And they're walking around in the fire, and there's a fourth man with them, and he's called the Son of God. Remember, God would say to the angels, I'm already there. <laughs> I'll take care of the situation. I'm there. I'll take care of the problem. And when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego fell into the fire, they felt the cord snap loose. They felt the, the bondage set free. Not a, they didn't smell hair. They didn't feel pain. They walked around, and they looked and saw the Son of God standing before them, and they shouted and they rejoice and they praise God because the fire shall never kindle upon thee. The fire will not burn you and not a hair on their head was sins. And Nebuchadnezzar looked down into the fire, the furnace door. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, did not we put three men in there? They said, true king. We put Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar said, wait a minute. Meshach, one. Shadrach, two. Abednego, three. Whoa, there's a fourth man in there. Woo! And the fourth man looks like the Son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he says to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Would you please come out? We would like for you to come out. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt your Pentecostal meeting, but would you come out? I don't want to interrupt your shouting and your dancing, but would you come out? And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego come out, and Nebuchadnezzar smelled. He said, I can't even smell hair singed. Can't even smell the smell of smoke or the fire upon their garments. And Nebuchadnezzar said, the God of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, he is God. Well, the fourth man didn't come out. He's still in the fire. Sister Jeanette sings a song, he's still in the fire. Kind of gives new thought when Michael, the warring angel, says, it'll take me a couple days, but I'll fight through and I'll get there. And God says, ain't, ain't, that's, that's too long. And Gabriel said, I can get there in 20 seconds. And God says, that's too long. Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego was about to go into the fiery furnace. And, they say, and God says, I'll just do it myself. You want something done right? Let God do it. And God said, I'll do it. And Michael and Gabriel probably said, how long is it going to take you? He said, I'm already there. And I want you to know God's already there. 
I don't know what you're going to face tomorrow, but God is already there. I don't know what you're going to face on the operating table, but God is already there. I don't know what you're going to face in the fiery furnace, but God is already there. I don't know what you're going to face in the raging storms, but God is already there. I don't know what you're going to face at the graveyard, but God is already there. I don't know what you're going to face in persecution, but God is already there. God is already there. He's the God that goes before us. He's the God that goes with us. He's the God that keeps us. He's the God that preserves us and keeps us. He's the God of all God. God's and powerful God. He's your creator. He said, thou art mine. Be not afraid. I have redeemed thee. You are mine. Don't you be afraid. When you pass through the waters, the flood waters, don't get disheartened. Don't get discouraged because I'm the water walking God. And I can bring you out of your cesspool of depression. You just got to watch me walk on the water. I can bring you out of your, your hard times. and I can bring you out of your discouragement. Just watch me walk on the water. Come to church and hear the preacher uh, preach about what God can do and start telling people that God is a can-do God. I don't want to go to church and hear a preacher preach about what God can't do. I want to come to church and hear a preacher preach about what God can do and what God does do. He's the God that goes before us. Before our storm, God is there. Before our trial, God is there. Before our decades ahead, God is there. He's the God that goes before us. Woo! And when you pass through the fire, you'll not be burned because I'm with you. I'm with you. I want you to know God's people are at their finest hour, I believe. The Lord's got plans. There's been a lot of strange things going on in the land. We got some strange politicians today. But some strange diseases. But some strange plagues in the land today. There's been some there's some strange people today. There's some strange things happening to the church today. But I want you to know he's the God that goes on before us. He's got it covered. I don't know what's going to be here five years from now, but he's the God of upstream. When it's time, we'll walk across. When it's time, we'll be victorious. When it's time, we will overcome. When it's time, we'll walk across in the promised land. When it's time. But it's not our time, it's his time. And God's working upstream. Amen. Have you stopped to think about it? God tells the children of Israel, I want you to go across over in the promised land. Josh is going to take you across. He said, get the Ark of the Covenant, get the priests, get them ready, and they start marching. He said, you stay back a ways because you've never passed this way before. You, 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 you look way back because I don't want the people to crowd your eyesight. Get way back a mile further back so you could focus on the Ark of the Covenant. Keep your eyes on my word. I talked about this a few weeks ago. And you watch that so you don't get smothered by the masses of crowds that are going the wrong direction. Keep your eye focused on the Ark of the Covenant. Keep your eye focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you walk down to Jordan, the priest will walk up there and just at perfect time, I mean just uh, 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 the waters at Zaratan, right there at the city of Adam, God is walling up the waters and God is calculating from the last drop of water when it would reach where they are across from Jericho, across the river. And God has calculated each drop and each trickle of water so that when it arrives, just at the momentous time, the priests step into the water and it's not there. It just comes up to the brim of their shoes and it's gone because the water's been well walled back and the rest of the waters went into the Dead Sea. All because God is an upstream God. He's planning things for you. I don't know exactly what God's got in plan for me. I don't know exactly what God's got in plan for you, but I know God's working upstream. Hear me? And we'll not be paralyzed at the floodwaters. We'll not be kept at the floodwaters. We'll not be paralyzed at the fire. Not be par- because he's the God that goes before us. You stop and think about it. He went before us in his death, 
those of us that are in this auditorium, I realize that others died before Jesus came, but the, the fact is he went before us in this auditorium. He went to the tomb before us. He went through the tomb for us and before us. He ascended back to the heavenly Father before us. Before we were ever born, Jesus ascended to the throne. He sat down on the throne of God before we were ever born. He went before us. He provided a salvation before us. He promised a salvation before anybody was ever born. In fact, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, before there was a blade of grass, before there was a speck of dust, before there was a world, before earth was created, God promised you and I eternal life. That's the God that works before us. He goes before us. That's the God that's an upstream God. He has all, he got it all worked out. God's got it all worked out. Amen? All worked out. And I want you to know today that Jesus Christ sat down on the throne, and one day we're going to face God in judgment. But you know what? We're, we're okay because Jesus went before us. Amen? The Word has went before us. His promises went before us. No wonder that verse of, of Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, is so popular. And songs have been sung by thousands. He's a God that goes before us. Because there is such a majestic truth in that. God has went before us. He even did it as a good shepherd. As the, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth them beside the still waters. He, 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 he brings them into the green pastures, calls them to lay down. He leads us in the, uh, in the paths of righteousness. He goes before us. Everything he takes before us. So, you know, you, you worried about tomorrow? Chill out. I mean, worry, worry today is sufficient for the day. You don't need no more. Don't borrow tomorrow. Some of you are deeply in debt with worry. Don't borrow for worry for a week ahead. Don't borrow worry for a month ahead. Don't borrow worry for days ahead. Just, just you know, the problems you have today are sufficient for the day. Don't, don't, don't get more. And take courage that God is the God that's went before you. Amen. He's already there. Yes. He's already there. One day I'll walk the streets of gold and I'll shout and praise God for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But right now, I'm not there, but he's already there. I don't know what we're going to face. This brought a lot of encouragement to me because young preachers, young singers, and young musicians, and young uh, men of God and women of God, I, you know, God's upstream. He's preparing some big stuff for you at the right time. You'll walk over. At the right time, you'll walk over. He is the upstream. God. Now, if that doesn't thrill your heart, I'd stay out of the furnace if I were you. If that don't thrill your heart, I wouldn't be trying to walk on water if I were you. If, I don't, if that don't thrill your heart, I, I don't think I'd be going fishing in the swamplands. I don't think I'd stay away from the raging rivers if that don't throw your heart. But I want you to know when Jesus Christ has come in our hearts, there's a boldness given to us that only God can give, and we're not afraid. Yes. We're not afraid. That's why he said, I command you, be not afraid. Don't be dismayed, because I'm the God who has redeemed you and bought you. When you walk through the waters, flood waters, the debris, the disheartment. Remember, there's a God upstream. When you walk near the raging rivers, remember, there's a God upstream. When you face the fiery furnace, remember, God's already there. Amen? God's already there. Amen. You know, Daniel, when he was going to be eaten by the lions... And God sent an angel to close the lion's mouth. And the angel closed the lion's mouth when Daniel was in the den of lions. 
If it had, if it had, if it had taken two or three weeks for the angel to get there, Daniel would have been eaten. But God told the angel, now you go on ahead because my servant Daniel is going in the lion's den and I want you there. And the angel was there and the angel had a little talk with the lions. And the angel said to them big old lions, he's now Brutus. Now Linus. Now, big beard, hey, big roar, there's coming a guy in here. He's not very big. He's not, he's not too meaty anyway, but there's, there's going to be a guy in here, and his, his name's Daniel. And I want you lions to know that you can't touch him. You're done. God sent me here, and you're going to obey me. You can't touch him. I can just hear the lion, old lioness say, well, can I smell of him? And the angel says, no, you can't smell him. No, Brutus man said, well, can I lick him? And the angel says, no, you can't lick him. And the lion says, you, what can we do? And the lion says, uh, and the angel said, you can do this. Because you're not going to be able to even roar. Because he's the God that followed ahead. God is the God that goes before Daniel. And he was safe. Amen? Yes. Them, them lions didn't have a chance. You say, well, they wasn't hungry. They'd ate at KFC prior. They were hungry because the king was so mad, he throwed them that started to the, the mutiny against Daniel, he threw them and their children, their family, and, the, and before they touched the floor of the lion's den, the lions ate them alive. They were hungry. I love it. I love it. I love how God does things. He was there for Daniel, and he'll be there for you. He'll be there for you. He said, what about the children of God that got eaten by lions in the time of Nero's time? What happened to them that were killed? Well, I believe God was already there. And I believe God was just picking up as they, as they gave their last breath. He got picking up and said, come on, let's go home. Let's go home. Let's go home. Let's go home. And I believe that God took a lot of the pain away to the place that they could sing hallelujah while they were burning at the stake. And the Christians used to tell their children when they set the lions loose to eat them alive in Nero's Colosseum, the Christian parents would say to their children, don't worry, it'll just be for a little bit and you'll be with Jesus. Now we as church people, we don't, we don't relate to that today, our day and time, we don't relate to that. But I want you to know that no matter what you go through, he's the God on time. And he's the God that goes before you. Amen? Amen. Hello. Hello. I'd rather be a snack for a lion as to miss heaven. It just wasn't time for Daniel to die because we needed the book of Revelation fulfilled. We needed all that, you know, that stuff. Amen. And, and there's some things that God's got you to do. There's, I don't know what is in store for us, but he's the God of upstream. And, it, and when it's time, it'll be time to walk over. Amen? I hope this sermon's helped you. I hope this message has strengthened you. I hope you've received from this. It was on Moses' birthday. Can you imagine that? It was on Moses' birthday. He said, God will go before you. 120 year old, got to go before you. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. Josh is going to come and bring a song. When I was preparing this sermon today, I thought, this is really a good way to look at life. This is really an awesome way to see 
that we do have a water-walking God. We do have a God that's there on time, that He goes before us. He watches over us. We do have a God that, that works upstream. And we do have a God that keeps us from burning. He comes to us. He's there. He's a God of great power, God of great grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Josh going to play and sing. Maybe you're going through something. Maybe, you, maybe you're going through some hard times in your life. Maybe you're going through some situations. You can come to this altar and you can say, God, I believe that you're ahead of me. I believe that you'll meet me there. I believe you're with me today and I believe you'll meet me there. You're the God that will be on time and the God that will be ahead. Josh, go ahead. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know that says the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust His cleansing blood Just in simple faith to plunge me Needs the healing cleansing blood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove Him more and more Jesus, Jesus Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Help me sing. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad. If you missed any of today's broadcast, would like to watch it again, or maybe share it with your friends, you can do that easily by heading over to our YouTube channel. Simply go to www.youtube.com forward slash Ozark School Gospel Church. You'll find today's broadcast as well as many other great messages. While you're there, be sure to click that red subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our latest videos. It's totally free and a great way to stay connected with us.